Some years ago, the prominent paleontologist, biologist, scientist, Dr. Margaret Mead, working in Africa, was asked when did she believe she saw the earliest signs of civilization? Now remember, among the ancient peoples, they had to deal with predators. They didn't have any of the kind of weapons we have today. And when the predators were after you, you often had to run. And if somebody was taken down, they left them behind. This was her theory. The most ancient skeleton that she had found in which there was a thigh bone that had healed from a break was her evidence of the first sign of civilization. Why? Because it meant that when that person fell, probably running from a predator, somebody, instead of running away, showed compassion to that human being, stayed, and brought them healing. Compassion. Who is the good Samaritan? The compassionate one. Who is neighbor? The one who shows compassion. That is what Jesus is teaching us in today's gospel. He was approached, as you heard, by this young lawyer, scholar of the law. Now we're talking the Torah, God's law, okay? We're not talking man's law, we're talking God's law. So this is a virtuous endeavor. He's a scholar of the law, and he asked Jesus, which is the greatest of the laws? Now Jesus, if you go through the Gospels, is asked questions hundreds of times. He almost never answers the question. He asks another question. There are only three occasions where Jesus answers the question. But hundreds of times, he turns the question on you. So he said to this lawyer, well, how do you read the law? And the young lawyer said, well, he quotes, by the way, two great texts. The first one is the Shema Israel. Okay, this is, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Okay, so that's the first one he takes from Deuteronomy. And then he takes the other one from Leviticus. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Some think Jesus created that. Go back. He's simply quoting Leviticus and bringing them together. And Jesus says, you're right. He was very pleased with the young man's analysis of the law. But then the fellow wants to narrow it down and say, well, who's my neighbor? If I'm to love my neighbor as myself, who is that? Would that include my family? Well, yes, of course. They're the closest neighbors. They live right next to you. They live with you. What about the people across the street? Of course. And what about the relatives? And what about the, how about the non-Israelites? Ah, so this is Jesus' opportunity, right? He takes the opportunity to teach by giving us this parable known as the parable of the Good Samaritan. And he tells the story of a fellow who had gone down this road. By the way, the road between Jerusalem and Jericho is several, it's close to several thousand feet descent. Imagine La Bajada, you know, you go up to Santa Fe or down from Santa Fe, the La Bajada Hill, that's it, okay? And Jericho, this ancient city, which is right near the Jordan River, is practically below sea level. It's very low down ancient city that was, you recall, captured when Moses died and Joshua took over, they crossed the Jordan River as they're returning to their homeland. And that's the first city that they take, Jericho. All right, so the man is traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. You know what's strange about it? He was by himself. You don't travel that road because there are lots of thieves. It's terrible roads, by the way, and lots of crags in which people would hide. The thieves would hide and wait to take you down. So you always traveled in a caravan, right? Here he is traveling alone. Who is this man? If you've ever read some ancient theater, there's a medieval play called Everyman. And it's a morality play. It's a great play. That man is every man. He represents all of us. He's fallen down. 
has been beaten up by life. Haven't we been beaten up by life? He represents us sinners, beginning with the original sin and all our personal actual sins. We've fallen off the road, okay? Now, the priest who's going on the road, he may have been going up to Jerusalem, the other direction, we don't know, and he sees this fellow. He figures either, number one, it's a ruse because that's what the thieves would do. They pretend to be wounded, and then when you go to help them, boom, they knock you down, kill you, and take your goods. Okay? Secondly, if he really is dead, he can't help him because the priest is not allowed to touch the dead when he's going up to Jerusalem to do his work at the temple. So he avoids it. The second one is a Levite. The Levites were the singers. They were the choir and also sort of like deacons. He avoids it, perhaps for the same reason. And now comes the Samaritan. You have to understand how much the Jews hated the Samaritans because they were compromised Jews. When the Assyrians took over the northern part of Israel, the Samaritans intermarried with the Assyrians, those from the region of Samaria. They were originally good Jews, like all the rest of them. Now they intermarry and they begin to mix up the religion. So devout Jews who lived in the north, a place called Galilee where Jesus grew up, that beautiful lush green part of Israel around the lake there, and those in the deep south, which is the desert, Jerusalem, Judea, so forth, would have nothing to do with the Samaritans. That was like, oh, don't even want to talk about them. Don't even mention a Samaritan. But Jesus mentions a Samaritan. It is this stranger who shows mercy to the man. Now, what does he do? He takes wine and oil. Wine as an antiseptic and then oil for the healing on his wounds. Does that sound familiar to you? Wine and oil. It should. He takes him then to an inn. What does the inn represent? It's the church. The Samaritan bathes the wounds, heals the wounds, takes him to an inn that we call the church and takes care of him. So the early fathers of the church saw Jesus as the good Samaritan. And then when he asks who treated him as neighbor, well, the young lawyer has to say, of course, the good Samaritan. He showed him compassion. Then he says, now go and do likewise. That's us. Because we are to imitate Christ. Right? There's a great classic in the Middle Ages called The Imitation of Christ. That's us. And so, being neighbor, how are you to be neighbor to the people around you? Is it just the people that you like? No, no. We have to find ways to reach out to those who may not even like us. But it must be in a winsome fashion. You will not win people to Christ through argumentation and hate through violence and cruelty. That will never work. That's the devil's way. What is Christ's way? It is compassion. I was at a, a wedding, I recall, when afterwards at the reception, I, there was a man on my right who was a Protestant from this deep south. And the fellow on my left was a fallen away Catholic. And I didn't know which one was going to be harder to deal with, the fallen away Catholic or the deep south Protestant. But the fallen away Catholic began to talk to me about someone that he had met who lived across the border and began to talk about the virtuous family life. And I thought, there's the entryway. Let's talk about family life, the importance of a virtuous family life, because I knew for a fact he had fallen away from that. See, that's how you reach your neighbor. It could be the person to your left, maybe the one on the right. Well, when I turned to him, he explained that he had worked, still works for AT&T, but he had worked uh, for their headquarters in Mexico City for several years. And he said, you know, he loved history. He went to the shrine of Guadalupe, but he didn't know what, he says, what is that Guadalupe all about? I thought, there's the entry point. And I began to tell him not just the history, but the miraculous intervention of our Blessed Lady. And by the end of that, he was so wowed, he practically jumped out of his seat. 
And I thought, okay, Blessed Mother, here we go. Praise God. There's the entryway. See, your neighbor, when we're out in the world, our mission is to win people for Christ. And we must do it with the truth, but as St. Paul says, speak the truth in love. He says that in his letter to the Ephesians. Speak the truth with love. If you can't do it with love, then it's not your turn. Just pray silently. There are many times where we are better to be silent than to speak. Listen to what the psalmist says to us in our psalm today, that beautiful Psalm 69. He prays, as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, at an acceptable time, O God, in the abundance of your steadfast love. Hear me. With your faithful help, rescue me from sinking into the mire. What's the mire? It's the mire of sin. And then he continues, answer me, Lord, for your steadfast love is good. According to your abundant mercy, turn to me. It's that abundant mercy of God. It's the compassion of God that will win us to Christ. And if we imitate Christ, we'll win others. St. Paul, in the second reading today, his letter to the Colossians, gives us this great hymn to Christ, who is the image of the invisible God. We see God through the face of Christ. Huh? And just a few verses before, listen to what St. Paul said, speaking to us. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints of light. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of our sins. That's the kingdom that we are called to represent. It is a kingdom of God's grace and mercy. And it's not far, as you heard from the first reading, it's not far from us. Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand. We need to grab hold of it, take it into the heart, and then glorify God by our lives.